hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Where Do We Begin? I believe it's episode 16 and Jackson, we recorded this about a week ago and it's one of my favorite episodes and just for the uninitiated, my name's Harper, my co-host is Jackson. Jackson, who have we got on today? So today we got Mitch Hannon, uh, current demon, uh, mature age recruit. We just learned a lot about his story and all this stuff. So um, yeah, really good guy. How do you reckon, Harper? Yeah, Jackson, you know we love a good kind of rags to riches kind of story here on the show uh, and someone who ne- hasn't necessarily done it the easy way. And Mitch Hannon was playing the VAFA, which is the amateur league in Victoria, just two years before he debuted for Melbourne. And he's uh, barely been dropped from the side since. He's an absolute gun. He's a forward for Melbourne, just plays his 50th game. Great guy. Uh, Jackson, what did you think about it? Yeah, huge episode. Um very keen to just get into it, so should we do that? Yeah, straight into it. It's going to be a cracker, so make sure you listen the whole way through. Let's go. So, uh, I'm absolutely delighted. Uh, he's our first ever current AFL player on the show. It's our 16th episode, I think, so it's taken a while, but welcome to the show, Mitch Hannon. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks very much for having me. So how's it all going up there? You're obviously in hub life. How's that been going? Uh, for me, not too bad. I'm um, I'm kind of enjoying it, to be honest. Just I feel like I'm quite lucky to sort of be away from Victoria at the moment. So um, I kind of consider myself a bit of a nomad. I don't really have much time me back to Victoria. So I'm quite happy to be up on the Sunshine Coast, um, <laughs> being able to sort of have a little bit more freedoms than I would if I was back home and, and obviously still lucky enough to continue to be playing footy. So it's... Um, yeah, it's not, not all doom and gloom up here. Um, so, and we've, we've, I think we've sort of been up here for about maybe eight weeks so far, and we've got about six to go. So, uh, it's been a while. Yeah. So, how has this whole situation been going? So, moving, have you just been based in one place and just moved to the other uh, states when you needed to play a game there, or has it been moving all over and staying in places regularly? Uh, so, we initially left back in early July, and. Um, under the impression that we were going to be going for five weeks. Um, and we moved up to Manly in Northern Sydney. Uh, and that was sort of our home for the initial period. Um, and then it very quickly after that two weeks became the Sunshine Coast. Uh, and then since then, we've kind of considered this sort of our home. And then, you're, as you said just before, we've, um, we've just sort of been hopping to and from places if, if need be for, for away games. So majority are sort of here in either Metricon in the Gold Coast or at the Gabba in Brisbane. Um, but on occasions we... Uh, in the past, we've flown to Adelaide for four nights. Uh, we're about to go to Alice Springs. Uh, and then next week, we're going to Cairns for four nights. So, yeah, just sort of globe trotting, well, <laughs> country trotting all over. Yeah. So. so, have you got a room to yourself or are you sharing with someone? I do, thank, thankfully. Um, it's good to hear. To be honest, like, I don't know if I could do three or four months away from home <laughs> sharing. Um, but no, nah, we've just sort of got host, hotel style rooms, just a very basic sort of. Uh, on suite, but and I guess fridge and, and, and bed and stuff like, stuff like that. And then uh, the majority of other stuff is sort of communal areas in terms of um, eating areas and so forth. So, but it's a tight sort of, like, as you can imagine, like most normal hotels, um, players are sort of all close by. So um, it's just sort of footy everywhere at the moment. So obviously you would have had to quarantine everything, but after that, have you been getting out into the sort of area around you? A little bit, yeah. So we kind of did our... Um, quarantining in, in Manly uh, where it was quite strict and we sort of were under strict protocols in terms of when we could leave the hotel. Um, since then, we're still under some some pretty strict regulations, um, but it has relaxed a little bit in the sense that we're, we're allowed to sort of go to the beach. Thankfully enough, it's walking distance um, for either a surf or a recovery or just a swim. Um, we're allowed to go up the street, up the street for, for a takeaway coffee or go to the shops. Uh, and there's some sort of rules around being able to see some some close family or friends for a short period of the day. So uh, at least at least we've been able to get out and about and do a little bit more than um, than your average Victorian. So I'm definitely not complaining. Yeah, I've um, been getting into any particular music or TV shows in your time by yourself up there or not? Nah? Um, movies, not so much. I've never really been a big um, watcher of, of TV series or movies. I listen to plenty of music. Um I'm a bit of a mishmash. I love it like some slow acoustic sort of old school or country vibe stuff. And then I also love my sort of deeper house, um, something with a little bit more behind it. So 
and also like podcasts, so um, similar to what you guys are doing here and, and some other people. I love just sort of going for walks and um, just tuning in and seeing what other people are talking about. So who's uh, got the big games room in the whole complex? Who's got the PlayStation and then where's everyone going to play? Uh, so in the communal area where, the, where we do have our meals, there's table tennis, there's, um, I don't know what you call it, like NASCAR, like car driving type stuff um, and a few other games. But I would say there's probably about 10 guys out of the 45 that are up here that, are, that have brought their PS4s. Um, I'm not one of them. I've never been a big gamer, but... Uh, there's a little cohort of them that most nights are playing 2K or um, a bit of FIFA or some Warzone or something like that. So no doubt they're um, getting plenty of screen time in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so obviously I think we'll move on from that kind of hub life thing now. But you're originally from Gisborne, is that right? Yeah. So I grew up in what you can kind of class as country Victoria. It's about, it's about an hour north of, of Melbourne. Um Grew up in I grew up in Macedon and then um, in my later teens moved to Gisborne. Um, so yeah, and that's where I sort of played a little bit of my footy and and went to school and sort of had my, my early um, upbringing. And then it wasn't until I was about twenty one, twenty two, I found myself living in the city. So how did your junior footy career go? Um, so I always loved my footy. It was always more just like a um, a pastime, something I enjoyed. I was always reasonably good at it, but I never really excelled. I was kind of one of those late developers that um, was kind of good from sort of the age of 12 and 13, 14, and then in the mid to to later half of high school, um, some guys sort of overtook me that went through puberty like a little bit earlier. And um, so I I played just more so for fun, played with some good mates um, at Gisborne, and then for my last year, actually played a season at Woodend with all the guys I went to high school with. And... um, from there, I uh, started sort of playing some good footy around that under-18 sort of level. Um, managed to get a pre-season with the Colder Cannons, which was my affiliate TAC Cup side. And um, wasn't to make it. Um, and then from there, I had a, f- a few more setbacks, quite a few actually, until I managed to find myself at Melbourne. So I went down to play St. Bernard's, uh, which is a, a club in the, the VAFA competition amongst the city. Um with the aim of trying to sort of get my foot in the door with some VFL clubs. My first one I got an offer from was Coburg. Um, did a pre-season and then wasn't to make the list there. Following year, got one from Essendon, did a pre-season and, and wasn't to make it from there. And then the third one was um, Footscray, which thankfully enough, they picked me up and put me on their list and I was about 20. <laughs> and then from there, managed to have a, a reasonable couple of years with them. And then at the end of that um, period, I was lucky enough to get drafted to Melbourne. Now, there's there's a whole lot to unpack there with what you just said. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, that's so, a little but, free maybe, <laughs> maybe first, uh, can you shed a bit of light into the your TAC Cup experience when you were 18, 19? Sure. Um, it's obviously a very exciting time as a young kid to sort of be invited to, to come and train with a, a TAC Cup team because um, – Everyone sort of in the schoolyard sort of looks up to you and you get all the gear and you're sort of on the radar for possibly getting drafted, which is um, a lot of young kids' dreams. So for me, I was, um, like I said, reasonably good at footy, but nothing special. I was um, a very late developer. I didn't do a lot of my growing or putting on weight until I was sort of 19, 20. Um, so I was sort of running around middle of the pack at Calder Cannons trying my best to, to get myself on the list. Um, didn't quite make it there. And I did the whole pre-season with them. And then just because of where I was living, I got offered a the chance to go and play a couple of practice matches with the Bendigo Pioneers. And um, I was like, oh, they they weren't as a high quality a team as, as Calder Cannons. And I thought I, my chances of getting on a TAC Cup list would be greater with them. And then it wasn't to be with them either. So um, that was a little bit disappointing because uh, at, at 17 and, and 18, setbacks like that are pretty hard to take because you haven't built up a level of resilience yet to sort of be able to sort of just cop it on the chin and, and move on. So I was, I was disappointed, but um, I'm also just went back after then to sort of try and play footy for fun rather than sort of um, anything to, in terms of trying to take it to any great levels. Uh, were you a forward back then like you are now? Or? No, I wasn't. Like most most guys when they're coming up through that, I was – I played all my juniors as a um, as a mid, and um, as I got to sort of that sort of age group, 17, 18, I, I found myself on the wing, um, kind of 
playing that role quite a lot. And then um, even even on my, at my time through sort of St. Bernard's and, and some of the VFL lists, I was always sort of that wing, a little bit of half forward, but it wasn't really until I found myself at, at Melbourne that I um, sort of assumed just that, that high half forward role. And I guess that's quite common for a lot of guys coming through the system. You you kind of just learn the basic skills of, of playing footy or if you're at a, playing at a reasonably high level, they just chuck you in the midfield, let you get run for it and, and do your thing. It's not until you sort of find your spot until you're sort of um, at the at the highest level. So you did go into the VFL. Did you just think you're going to resign to playing in the VFL or were you any chance, like were you thinking, oh, I'm going to get to the AFL from there? If I'm honest, I, I honestly never thought I was any chance of getting drafted. I... I always said to myself, like, oh, look, I'm young. I enjoy playing footy. I'd love to just play the highest level of footy I, I can. Uh, and for me, like, I don't know why I sort of kept it at that ceiling, but I thought, like, if I could get onto a VFL list, um, I've made it here. Like, um, none of my mates had really done that, and I was, I'd was i be quite content. So, to be honest, like, yeah, I never really thought it would happen. Um, and that probably comes off the back of, of not really being fully developed at the time when I had those sort of um, – those sort of – that mindset on, on where I wanted to take it. I hadn't really finished growing. I hadn't really put on enough weight yet. Um, so when I did get to, to a VFL list, I was quite happy and content. And then obviously naturally your goal sort of goes one step further. And I, I just wanted to play one game and be like, oh, I've played a game of VFL footy. And then you start getting a few under your belt and you're like, oh, I wouldn't mind trying to see myself a regular in this team, which then happened. And then um, the team I was playing with at the time, being the Footscray Bulldogs uh, in 2016 was quite a successful period for their, their, their AFL team as well as our VFL. So we went on to, to win a grand final that year in the VFL, um, which is kind of where my next sort of goal went. And then, yeah, in terms of AFL interests, I really wasn't sure if anything was going to come and it didn't really until very late in that my second year of AFL. And they, they sort of all came at once. Just taking one step back there, I'm not sure if you mentioned it before, but I think in 2015 you were playing for um, St. Bernard's at the same time as Footscray. So obviously um, the VFL system probably doesn't have the elaborate kind of scouting system that the AFL does. So how do they pick you up? That's a good question. Yeah, so I was um, at St. Bernard's. My main reasoning for going down there was I had a, a friend and his dad at the time who was going down to coach and play and I thought, being in that league amongst the city would be a far greater chance of being noticed by anyone um, than playing out where I grew up. Um, so that was my sort of first step. And then thankfully enough, I managed to sort of find myself um, quickly going from under 19s level into their seniors. Um, and then it's kind of, once you're in that sort of mold, it's more so a little bit sort of who you know, rather than also just playing great footy. Um, so thankfully enough, one of the guys I was playing with on my team, his name was Chad Jones. Um, an ex West Coast player uh, was also the forward line coach at Footscray. So I um, he didn't really make that too public, but like when I started playing some footy with him and and so forth, I, I think he sort of passed on my name, and then I sort of had a little bit more of a look. And then thankfully enough, just through that connection of who I was playing with at St Burns, I was lucky enough to get in the eyes of some people at Footscray. So you did get uh, after the your 2016 season at Footscray. Did you go through the whole draft camp sort of situation, being the older guy? So you would have been 22 at the time, I think. Going through that whole draft camp, did you go through it with the 18-year-olds? I didn't, know. So the draft camp, in terms of the testing and, and sort of sussing out the crop for that draft pool, that all happens quite early in the year. I think it's back in uh, April or May or something like that. And and back then I wasn't on the, the, the draft radar at all. Um and then I sort of played a lot of my footy in that VFL season at the back end, especially the good footy. Um, so I didn't really go through all the, the traditional steps of interviews and, um, and so forth with clubs that a lot of the under-18 guys do. So I didn't have to do any testing. Um, I did a lot of off-site interviews about two or three weeks before the draft. Um, so for me, it just sort of all came very late, the interest. Um, so thankfully enough, I... I was friends with a, a guy who, at Footscray who was sort of the strength and conditioning guy and he was able to sort of put a parcel together some basic numbers on who I was as an athlete, which I could then forward on to these clubs. And then um, from there, they sort of just, they just go off some vision of seeing you playing VFL and then also face value on, on what you are as like as a person. So 
after about seven or eight interviews, I think it might have been eight interviews with different clubs, um, I, was, I was lucky enough to get picked up by Melbourne. So just hypothetically, obviously you're at a AFL affiliate site in Footscray, but if you were at a, uh, like a club like you mentioned before, like a Coburg, my boys, uh, like a smaller club like that, do you reckon you would have been um, found by AFL recruiters or it would have been much harder? Uh, I think that sort of, I think it would probably be been quite the same. Once you're in the VFL system, it's it's quite highly regarded as, a, as obviously a high standard of footy throughout the country. It's sort of, it's up there with the Sandful and the Kneeful and and that mould of sort of guys coming through the TAC Cup, um, as you've seen in the last four or five years, I think it has changed in the fact that there's always about half a dozen to a dozen now mature age recruits getting picked up and they're always looking for people who are sort of more ready-made um, to be able to come into a club and, and sort of impact straight away rather than have that four or five years of sort of development. So there's once you're in the VFL system and you're actually playing games, there's definitely guys who are um, uh, always watching. So I think whether you're playing at Footscray or whether you're playing at a non-affiliated AFL club like like Coburg or or wherever or something like that, you'd, um, you'd still be noticed. So you did mention you got picked up by Melbourne, but you you were interviewed by a few other teams. Were there any uh, thoughts you were going to go somewhere else? Yeah, it's interesting the um, interview process. They some don't give a, a lot away. Others kind of make it pretty evident where you sort of sit, and others um, kind of fluff it up a bit. And but um, for me, like it was a very interesting time. I'm, I'm working full time in the city. Um, footy was a, like a part-time gig that I would do after hours. Um, and then all of a sudden I was getting these phone calls and sitting down with these meetings. Um, I, I had an inkling that I was probably, if any, if any of the two or any of the clubs I was going to go to, it was probably going to be Freo or Brisbane. They sort of showed the most amount of interest. Um, but then very late, I got some, some good signs from, from Melbourne. So I think in the end they sort of jumped the gun and, and managed to pick me up a little bit earlier than some of the other teams. Uh, were you going for an AFL team as a kid or when you were in the VFL? Uh, oh, prior to the VFL, I I grew up barracking for West Coast um, and that just purely comes off the back of um, who my old man barracked for growing up. And then once you get to that age where you're sort of playing in an environment like Footscray, who's heavily affiliated with the Western Bulldogs, I've very much found myself just barracking for, for the Bulldogs. So, um at that time because I was training in the same facilities, crossing paths with guys who were playing on TV and so forth. It naturally just, you kind of gravitate towards having an interest in how they're going on the weekend. And then obviously when you find yourself at Melbourne, you're all for the club that you're playing for. So, but yeah, all my junior years was West Coast, which is a bit bizarre growing up in Victoria. Yeah, uh, definitely. But um, Footscray Premiership in 2016, obviously, and the Western Bulldogs in the AFL, the seniors, um, do you reckon that AFL team doing well uh, like lifts the VFL team up and the VFL grand final the week before, obviously, do you reckon that lifts the AFL team up at all? Yeah, definitely. I think um, like the wave of momentum that goes through a club, like when there's success, it sort of starts from the bottom as up as well. So we, there, there was even at the time, I think even though it was a limited competition, the AFLW um, Western Bulldogs team won the premiership that year as well. And um I think we had quite a healthy list as well through the through the the whole uh, the Western Bulldogs list. So there was a number of sort of think, um, listed AFL guys um, playing in that VFL Grand Final, and then um, yeah, I think that just that sort of like that momentum of success and that wave of of having a good run and 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 so forth was sort of filtering from the bottom up, and we all sort of managed to to, to ride that wave in that year. So you did get picked up by Melbourne in the 2016 draft. You had an early setback. You hurt your shoulder early preseason. How was that? Thinking you might not make round one. Yeah. So in my final year of, of VFL with Footscray, I um, I actually hurt my shoulder in round two, and quite it was quite sore. And, and I sort of had two options, and it was to either have surgery at that point um, early in the year and miss the rest of the season, or they said we can sort of rehabilitate it and strengthen it up. You probably miss about eight or nine weeks but then you'll be able to sort of play the back end of the season. Um, and then but at, at the end of the year, you'll have to have surgery. And I went with the latter, thankfully. Um, probably it was a life-changing decision, if you ask me, because if I had to miss that whole year, I obviously wouldn't have got drafted. Um, so I decided to play it out, and then we had the success we did, and then straight after I had surgery on my shoulder. So 
as soon as I got to Melbourne, I was in sort of rehab mode and, um, yeah, still finding my feet amongst the club, working out where I stood with um, a lot of the players and, and whether or not I was worthy enough of a spot in round one. But um, luckily enough for me, I, I managed to do a lot of things right during that pre-season and then come the start of – or the end of March, start of round one, I was, um, I was in the team. Yeah, obviously you had a pretty um, sharp rise from the uh, VAFA to the VFL, up to the AFL in just a few seasons. But uh, when you're in the AFL in that first pre-season, do you have something in your own mind? Like you said, do you think you're worthy of being in the 22 or does that not really come across your mind? Um, definitely not in the first couple of months. You really just sort of, like, you don't know what the AFL standard's like, to be honest. If it's such a huge jump between VFL or AFL, you, um, you, you yeah, you can't really prepare for, for where you sort of sit and whether or not you're worthy enough of around one spot. I think you've got to kind of um, get into training, um, train against some guys who have obviously established themselves in the, at that top level to see where you sort of match with them. Um, and for me, that I couldn't really do that because I was still rehabilitating my shoulder. So I, I, even though I was getting fit and doing all the right things to be able to come back and play, I wasn't sure where I sort of stood um, in terms of being able to sort of impact at AFL level. Um but lucky enough for me, like um, the coaches quite liked the stuff I was doing um, later part of the, the preseason and then it sort of gave me a little berth into round one. So um, it was a bit of a surprise, to be honest. I didn't expect to be playing. So, but you did end up playing. How was that experience for you, just being in front of like a huge Demons crowd, round one against the Saints? Yeah, that's amazing. Um, was that Eddie had? Um I love playing at Etihad in general. Um, I think I'd, ob- I'd obviously played the, the VFL Grand Final about six months prior in, in front of about maybe 15, 20,000. And then that Saints game, I couldn't tell you, but it, I think it was roughly about 50,000 of that game. So um, oh, it was amazing. You're just filled with adrenaline. Um, you're mixing it with some people that like you've only ever seen on TV. Um, like, yeah, you don't really know whether or not you're going to have an impact yet. You're just kind of running around, playing on instinct, hoping you can just get a touch. And then once you do get that sort of first touch of the footy, the pressure's off a little bit because no one really wants to run out there and um, not find the ball at all. So, um, but no, it was amazing. I had all I had about 20 family and friends there watching. It's a, it's a great experience. Yeah, it's interesting you say that uh, Eddie had or Marvel now is one of your favourite grounds to play at because – all my Melbourne mates, they, they like, love to have a whinge about playing at Marvel instead of the MCG. They don't <laughs> like it there. <laughs> so how would you compare the two grounds? Because obviously both your two home grounds, how, how would you compare them? Um, I would say that like uh, the MCG obviously is is a, a beautiful ground to play at. Um, they're just different styles. It's quite artificial at, at um, Eddie Had or Marvel in the sense that there's very little wind, uh, quite a hard surface, um, very sort of skinny and narrow sort of ground. It's, yeah, it just is the perfect recipe for, for a fast game of footy, um, whereas the G is a lot more open to the elements. Um, there's always bigger attendances in, in the crowds. Um, I wouldn't say we'd necessarily play better or, or worse at either or, but I'm sure everyone has their preferences on, on grounds. Atmosphere, the G, you can't go past, but um, in terms of trying to play good footy, I love playing at Marvel. So by the end of the 2017 season, you kicked 22 goals in 20 games. Do you think that sort of exceeded your expectations? Yeah, definitely. I <laughs> see, like, I, I think that just comes naturally to me to sort of like hit, set the bar quite low. Um, so I just sort of thought, oh, imagine if I could get a couple of goals at AFL level. Like, I could retire or be delisted a happy man. Like, I've kicked a goal. Um, so like every game that rolled on and I kicked a few more, I, I genuinely didn't expect anything like that to happen. So, um, you just kind of want to make sure that your coaches are happy and, and you're doing the right things and you, you just, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's not on your, your radar to sort of be like, oh, I need to kick X amount of goals. Cause to be honest, I was just stoked to be out there. Um, I think it's fair to say you came into the demons just after their, big down period that they had for quite a while. So uh, could you see that the club was working like really, really hard to kind of change the culture, I guess, and um, yeah, just change their fortunes? Or is it just like another day at the office, really? Um, I think that the club's been trying to do that for a while. They've obviously experienced um, sort of probably the last 15 years or so um, quite a, 
or they've been missing quite a lot of success. They, they're getting used to sort of being at the bottom half of the ladder. So I think, um, I don't know, you come in as a fresh face, you don't really know a lot about their history or you just sort of watch them as a spectator. So like you, first and foremost, you want to sort of make sure you, you do well for yourself and, and put your name up there for, to be able to play. But once you start regularly finding yourself in the team, you definitely um, start transitioning to that mindset of wanting to sort of play more so for the success of the team and, and sort of see that um, old history sort of be forgotten about as a sort of new mould of players come through and sort of um, change change that sort of landscape of, of what the, the demons have previously looked like. So we're still sort of on that journey. We've had a few ups and downs since I've been there. We had a couple of good years in 17 and 18 and obviously very poor last year, but um, we sort of think we're sort of trending towards getting that back this year. So um, I think it's, it's going quite positively. So, yeah, you did mention 2018. Um, first finals, how did that feel for you? Uh, that was very surreal, to be honest. I um, ah, that, that all happened very quickly. We were never really a sure thing for finals, so you're never sort of prepping for it. It's just kind of crept up quite quickly. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. It's just one of those things where you're just sort of purely running on adrenaline, I guess. So in, in, in footy terms, it's just another game of footy, but in the scheme of life, some people go through their whole AFL career with never being able to play in a game as big as those. So, um, yeah, I'm just thankful that uh, for me, I was, in terms of performance, I was in form and managed to find myself in the team and was able to be a part of, of those um, three games. It's just the, the crowd is something else, the the, the atmosphere, um, and then obviously looking back on it now being roughly two years ago, um, it's just it's definitely a fond memory of mine. So also with 2018, you saw the rise of another VFL mature age recruit, Brody Majacek. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you think you and Brody sort of f- fly the flag for all these um, state league players to come into the AFL and just sort of make an impact? Uh, I wouldn't say myself necessarily and Brody. I think there's, there's about a handful of these, these kind of guys now that um, – that are coming in at sort of their early twenties and and being able to sort of have an impact straight away and, and the fact that they were they were a mature age recruit I think it's quite quickly forgotten about um, it's more so what you're able to do once you're in the system so but it's there's definitely a place for that in, in today's game where clubs need someone who's sort of ready made and and can um, come in and sort of offer something right from the get go so I'm glad that I was able to do that and, and still trying to to carry that out now being in my fourth year. Um, but there's multiple guys um, across the, f- the field that are coming in and, and and being able to do that. So just back to that famous final series again, one of the things that the Melbourne fans love you most for, I think it's fair to say, is that famous goal against the Cats. <laughs> uh, running into the open goal, you ran long distance, probably 30, 40 metres at least. You kick that goal, just talk us through the adrenaline rush and the moment. Yeah, so it's it's fourth quarter and um, it's obviously a tight game and that was the first final against Geelong. And um, yeah, to be honest, I don't have a great memory on that moment because it is purely just, obviously it's another game of footy, but you're just running so hot on adrenaline. And since I remember what happened, but I don't necessarily remember the magnitude of what was happening in front of me. You're just kind of in the zone really. But um, I remember sort of being down, down the line, um, the ball got kicked over my head and I remember Henderson sort of slipped. And um, when I got the ball, my first thing, and it always is the first thing, if I'm off, I've got a long stretch of run ahead of me, was don't stuff this first bounce up because it's very easy to sort of put the jets on, put the, bounce the ball and just watch it disappear straight back over your head. So my first bounce is extremely tentative. And then, um, yeah, I guess I just sort of strode, strode up the wing and I had genuine intentions of actually passing it off <laughs> as, as much as it probably doesn't look like it. Um, and then... Um, uh, the guy that was coming sort of at me was sort of in two minds and then I just remember thinking I'm going to have a shot at goal here and thankfully not, it went through. All right, yeah, so, and then the next week uh, in the semi-final against the Hawks, yeah. uh, the, they've just come off their big dynasty era. So uh, that's, and you made a prelim in that game, first prelim for a long time, maybe since 2000 against uh well, I don't know who the prelim was against, but it was against the Bombers, the grand final. So what was that? That was probably one of the biggest games from, from Melbourne for a long, long time. So talk us through that game. Yeah, they, you're right. They were, they, they're they always a team that's, um, no matter 
Oh, for me, no matter sort of how they're going at the moment, you're kind of always carrying the back of your mind the team that they once were so through that little dynasty. So they're sort of always a threat. Um, but for us, we were like, we were running hot through that period in the sense that we were like um, very confident in the way we were playing. Um, we had some guys in some good form. Um, we were able to sort of dominate games through contests and just sort of like outmuscle our opponents. So even though they're a force to be reckoned with, I think we went into that game kind of like it's quite fearless. We just sort of thought like we're underdogs here where we, in terms of where we finished on the ladder. No one's really expecting us to do much. Um, but realistically, we were very confident that we could get it, get that one done. So as you saw that play out, it was always, a, it was a bit of a tussle for the majority of it, but um, yeah, we were able to sort of run over the top of them in the end. So you probably don't want to talk about this one too much. <laughs> yes, next there we go. I knew it was coming. West Coast game. I think, I think we've got to talk about it. We'll skip over the first half. We probably won't talk about that too much. But at half time, uh, what do the coaches say to you? Like, because you're probably out of the game, I think it's fair to say, 60 something points down. What are they telling you at half time? Oh, look, in that moment, there's there's no looking back. It's just like you'd, you'd rather sort of lose a game like that, to be honest, by about 100 points plus trying to win it rather than sort of um, hanging on and making a few adjustments that are quite um, safe and sort of losing it by about 20 or 30. So for us, we just went sort of ultra attacking and, and tried to change up a few things to sort of uh, to rattle West Coast as much as we could. But to be honest, as soon as we, we stepped foot on the ground, um, like, yeah, we were sort of like, I guess, a little bit underdone. They, they're a quality outfit. Um, they've got some big bodies. Um, they were playing on their home deck. It's... Even though I said before the uh, the elation and the sort of atmosphere of the MCG is something else, being at Optus Stadium when uh, it's jam packed, but pretty much jam packed to people that are against you, is by far the loudest I've ever heard a crowd. Um, that place is like a, a cauldron of just just noise. I think it must be acoustically designed or something like that to, for that reason because it is just so loud. But um, yeah, I guess we. We look back at that game and we just kind of got beaten in all assets. We just genuinely, they were a better side than us on that day by far. Yeah, being a Collingwood supporter, I've definitely got nightmares just like you about West Coast in 2018. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, like, weirdly enough, we're actually, um, we're rooming up here with Collingwood at the moment. We sort of face, we see them every day just walking around the, the complex that we're staying at. But um, yeah. I guess <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> How does that go? Since you actually like you played Collingwood uh, last week or the round before, sorry. How does that go when you've just recently played this team and you're seeing them every day? Yeah, it's bizarre. It's it's just the world we live in at the moment with the footy. You've just kind of got to adjust. Uh, like for example, where this current week we're playing St Kilda in um in Alice Springs, uh, and then we followed by that where catching the same flight home as them. You just kind of got to get accustomed to the idea of um, making do in, in circumstances. So, yeah, we go Collingwood. At, um, we had a great win over them last week, which is which was awesome. But it's always just uncomfortable being in that environment where um, you're kind of in your downtime and you're trying to switch off from footy, but you're walking um, down the path and there's just like opposition teams scattered throughout the complex. So, I don't know, it's just one of those things that sort of sums up 2020, I guess. Yeah, uh, I was going to say before, we were talking about um, Optus Stadium and oh, I'm a Bombers fan, uh, if you don't know, Mitch, and I was there for the final against West Coast last year and I can tell you, I absolutely agree with you. As like a rival fan, the, just the intimidation you get from like 55,000 West Coast fans in the ground all going off their nut, it's just absolutely crazy. Uh, yeah, so just moving off the finals from 2018 because we've uh, definitely got that covered. Uh, <laughs> We'll talk about your injury struggles last year. So the Demons didn't have their best year as a team, and but you didn't really get on the field too much. So what was that whole frustration like? Yeah, for me, that was one of those frustrating years, As it, not only for me personally, but as a team. Um, I battled um, with some knee issues early. Um, I just struggled to sort of overcome them. I managed to I had to have a second surgery on one of my troublesome knees, and um which was, which was annoying. I was planned to sort of come back for round one and then wasn't to be and then managed to sort of get myself up and running by mid-year. Um, but f- as a team, we, we'd had a very poor start and um, was sort of, yeah, feeling the effects of probably the weight of expectations of what happened the year before. And I managed to get about f- six games under my belt at AFL level 
and then um, just due to the loading of how things work in terms of how I, I tried to ramp up my knee um, and the physical exercise I put through my body at quite a rapid rate, my uh, my groins began to sort of give way. So I um, after those six games, pretty much missed, well, I missed the rest of the year and um, kind of my year became a write-off just purely because I wasn't really able to get back to my best um, and up and running. So... Yeah, frustrating, frustrating sort of year all round. Um, it's hard sort of watching your team go out there and not replicate anything close to what happened the previous year and, and not really be able to help in any regard. But I guess that's footy. There's um, injuries come and go and, and sometimes you sort of need the, the weight of luck to sort of go your way. And that, and that also didn't happen last year with, um, with our playing list. So obviously this season is one of the more crazier ones that we've ever had. Um, do you think the demons are doing well despite the circumstances? I think so. Yeah, I think um, I think everyone's in the same boat in terms of how to make sure some adjustments. There's people that have got family, kids that they've been able to bring up, or others who haven't been able to quite make it up. But um, in terms of, like I said before, the luck sort of going your way and so forth, I think we've been quite we've done quite well to sort of be able to have a quite an injury free list and be able to sort of put a good quality side out there most weeks. Um, we struggled with some form issues maybe quite early in the year, but I think at the moment you're sort of seeing us slowly start to rectify that and get back to playing um, a little bit better brand of footy or something that's a little bit more recognisable of, of what we did in 2018. So I think um, given the circumstances, I think we're doing quite well. Now it's something that I myself am very curious about and I bet a lot of people are too. So can you talk us through your daily routine and your training and your leisure time and all that stuff that happens in the hub? Sure. So we've still got our regular routine in terms of training where we're, um, uh, I guess, training three times a week in terms of physically out in the field. And then in amongst that, we're doing our gym sessions, um, our education, our um, match reviews. We also do some other things like some um, some mindfulness, um, some regular yoga or, or Pilates and, and injury prevention type exercises. And then um, I guess from there you get your usual free time, but it's it's with a twist, I guess. We're sort of when you try and have your free time at home, I, I know I personally try to escape from footy as much as possible and I made a point of living with some mates that, that I don't play with and, um, and do some other things outside. But you've got to sort of make do around here. So I've like I've tried, I've kind of tried to join the crew of guys that do a bit of surfing. Um, so that's sort of happening quite regularly in my downtime. Um, other than that, takeaway coffees and um, what I would normally do um, when I'm back home is try and keep my mind occupied with some sort of hobby. And for me, that's um, this brand called Mendel, which I've, I've recently started up and been working on with one of my close mates. Um, even though I'm not down in Melbourne and sort of helping with some of the stock and sort of the more hands-on activities, I'm still able to sort of do some stuff um, through email and, and online and, and sort of keep that sort of ticking over in the background. So those sort of three, I guess, in terms of chilling with teammates, coffees, surfing and, and some Mendel stuff is what's keeping me busy at the moment. Yeah, so uh, Mendel's a mental health, is it is it a charity or can you just talk us through that a bit? Yeah, sure. So it's a, it's a non-profit brand. So essentially we're a business, we're an apparel label that's in a business that supports um, – men's mental health and we're not a charity as such but what we do is we state um complete clarity with the fact that we on donate um 100 of the profits um from our from the purchases of, of the clothing to a charity of the month so uh, we sort of recognize that there was already some some charities out there doing some great work in the mental health space and there was no point necessarily creating our own or competing or so forth we, we wanted to sort of um, make something that was Interesting. So when I say we, um, my close mate Mark, who I used to work with prior to football, um, create something that sort of obviously created some funds to on donate to, to these charities, but more so to the point, create something that sort of um, created some conversations and sparked um, some chats amongst particularly men our age around their own mental health and, and sort of making it a little bit more um, common in, in the adolescent. Uh, yeah. Have you got a website that people can check out if they want to go to it? Yeah, sure. It's um, so it's Mendel, which is M-E-N-D-L dot com dot au. So, 
yeah, there's a, there's a few platforms on there. We we do a um, I think called the Mental Movement where we sort of try to create some of these conversations um, and sort of like provide an example or a roadmap for guys who who may be struggling. But then there's obviously the shop part of it where we we've tried to create a, a label that's quite minimalistic and subtle, um, something that kind of guys resonate with purely because they think it looks good um, and and would happily wear amongst their mates. And then for those who don't know the brand or or may be intrigued, they can sort of reach out and. And ask the question, "What is that?" and and that's the stepping stone to to starting that that conversation. So obviously, it's a pretty shitty time for a lot of people, especially here in Melbourne. Um, it's a good reminder to check on your mates, um, so, to ask them how they're going and all that. So, um, but what do the footy clubs do like inside? Because we we've had more of a open uh, discussion about mental health inside footy clubs with sort of Dame Beams coming and out and saying all the, the mental health issues he had. Uh, what do what do the footy clubs do? Like, what does Melbourne do for you guys to sort of make sure your mental health's in check? Um, so there's obviously the there's the the stuff that's sort of the support that's there, the network for guys who who may just want to sort of reach out and chat. So like obviously most clubs have a or all clubs have a psychologist on hand um, and some some support through the AFLPA for um, some. Um, contacts outside of the sort of AFL. It's, it's a tricky one sort of being in the hub at the moment because obviously um, everyone's sort of forced into the football environment sort of against their will. So, um, but there's definitely been a trend, I would say, probably ever since I've been in the AFL system, which has been three and a half years now of just more of a genuine openness towards um, the conversations or the idea of one struggling with their own mental health. So, um the support sort of, I think that sort of stems from a lot of the leaders amongst the AFL club. And I'm only speaking on behalf of Melbourne here, but um, the guys that are sort of at the, t- the, t- the top tier and the coaches and so forth, them being able to sort of um, express and show a level of vulnerability in a sort of public setting to, to their peers and the younger playing group um, and sort of be open and honest about how they're going sort of sets the platform for um uh, younger guys or people who may be less open to sort of talking about their feelings or something uncomfortable. Um, and that's been set up throughout the club through some some sort of little off-field tasks where we do um, semi-regularly to be able to sort of, yeah, have that opportunity for guys to sort of, um, whether it be there's, also, there's private and there's also sort of public places for, for guys to kind of um, delve into those spaces. So I would definitely say the mould of speaking about mental health um in the football industry is is definitely changing for the better. Yeah, you sound like a guy who's really knows what he's doing outside of footy and you're not just all footy, footy, footy. And I reckon that will probably help you a lot post-career, hopefully. But do you reckon that's a lot because you weren't straight into the AFL system at 18 like most people were? Uh, potentially, yeah. So for me, the idea of Mendel, um, we didn't delve into this before, it stemmed off the, the back of, um, my own troubles with my mental health. Um, some periods through 2018, I, I really struggled with some some anxiety and, and that was a mixture of performance anxiety with footy. But for me, the majority of it was off field and it was to do with some stuff that was going on in the background with some family um, and some friends and, and likewise. And it was just sort of circumstantial and um, it was a feeling that was quite foreign to me, especially to the level at which I felt it throughout that year. Um, and was very uncomfortable and, and quite hard to deal with. So after I sort of saw myself through that that sort of three month period, um, and a year a year later when I found myself in a, a much better headspace, I sort of wanted to create something um, purely whilst I was still in the football environment that is quite well networked and, and helps to sort of get the message out there. Create something that I was quite passionate about, which is which is mental health, particularly in in men um, and young men. Um, but I want to sort of subtly do it with my own sort of twist um, and sort of create something that, yeah, guys who um, may not have even experienced anything in, in terms of their own mental health or something like that, that would happily support and sort of get around. And, and, and that's when Mendel came about. So, but like you said earlier, I think that that probably does come off the back of coming to the system a little bit later. Um, I worked, I went to uni and, and worked uh, full time for about a year. Um, so I had a taste of what, life was like as your regular sort of uni student and and working um, nine to five and just having a group, group of friendship uh, mates and friendship circles and and then sort of finding myself in that football bubble which is which is a completely different world so I would say that that yeah having that grounding of a regular sort of 
junior life and then finding myself into footy late has held me in good stead. Now, if you're listening to this on the Facebook live stream, like I know a few people are right now, uh, you'll know, hopefully know about our Mullets for Mental Health campaign uh, fundraiser that Jackson and I are doing. Uh, so next Tuesday, I think it is, uh, Jackson and I, September the 1st, Jackson and I are going to be cutting ourselves some mullets. So go check out our Facebook post from a few days ago uh, to check out how you can get behind that campaign. But just a bit further uh, onto that mental health thing, Mitch, um, did, was it just like the club psychologist that helped you through that or did you keep it hidden or your teammates or what kind of thing? How did you interact with it? Yeah, so initially I, like most men, I, I try to sort of keep it amongst just purely myself and keep it quite internal because I, the, the feelings were quite foreign and, and I didn't really know how to quite handle it and um, I didn't really want to make a big huff and puff about um, some of the physical symptoms that were coming about, which was just obviously like an accelerated heart and a lack of sleep and a lack of diet and sort of feeling stressed and worried. And I didn't, I want, I tried to keep that as hidden as much as possible because I just purely out of the fear of letting that sort of slide and, and, and having people that I wasn't um, that close with sort of hearing that and, and sort of judging that situation. So um, for me, it was a mixture of things, but the, the overarching thing that kind of helped me through it was probably the idea of conversation. So, and that's where mental stems from. I think um, being able to sort of open up and be quite vulnerable um, to a mixture, for me, it was a mixture of people. It started off with some close family, my mum and sister at the time uh, and my girlfriend at the time. And then kind of from there flow, f- flowed on to, to seeing a psychologist quite regularly. Um, but actually the hardest part, and which obviously came to fruition was sort of having these, some of these conversations with my mates. Um, they're the guys that you spend a lot of time with, um, that you care about their opinion, you enjoy their company, but sort of showing a level of vulnerability in terms of having a chat about how you're feeling is very uncomfortable. And then, um, I'm not going out there and, and telling people to, that we should all do that amongst our friendship groups um, because it is an odd thing and a, a, a weird feeling to sort of to have those kind of chats. But the more and more we can kind of make them a little bit more ingrained into society as something that's um, quite normal, we'll hopefully start to yeah, ingrain this kind of idea of conversation amongst men, um, like similar to what women do. They, they quite often vent their feelings and thoughts and hopefully one day men can too. Yeah, it's definitely a big reminder just to check out with your mates, see how they're going and everything. Um, so we do have a few listener questions. So uh, first up we have uh, from Janet. Uh, how do you miss playing to Melbourne crowds, especially at the MCG? Yeah, I'm. I miss it heaps, to be honest. I um, I feed a lot in terms of my my energy and um, adrenaline off what's happening in the crowd. Um, just being out in the oval with an MCG, even if it's half full, is just amazing. Um, you kind of find yourself more ingrained in the game and and feeling the ups and downs of the crowd roaring and. Um, to be honest, it's it's one of the big reasons you play footy. Obviously, you're bringing joy to those close to you, like your family and friends who are watching on TV, but just even the people that you hardly know, you bring joy to fans that have no real um, tie with you other than just being a supporter of the club, seeing the elation or the, um, the happiness that they get out of um, the victory that we can sort of play a part in have, um, occurring is, um, is amazing to be a part of. So I, I miss playing in front of crowds for sure. Uh, now, I can kind of attest to this one because I actually did work experience at the Melbourne Footy Club a couple of years ago. Uh, so I've had a chat with Max Gorn before, so and he's a lovely, lovely bloke. I don't know him too well, obviously, but yep. from what it seems, he seems like a lovely bloke. Uh, so this one's from Leo. Is Max Gorn as nice as he seems? I don't think you can say no to that, can you? He is. He's actually one of the best blokes. He Like what you see in terms of him on the footy show or on radio or on TV interviews is Max as a person as well. He's... um. He's a, he's a big people person. He's um, a very friendly, easygoing, kind of one of the one of the guys type personality. But he's also, obviously, in, in recent years, had to sort of switch that to be able to sort of be a leader amongst the group. He's obviously our captain now, but he's found a fine balance between, um, yeah, leading a group of young men and being serious and sort of um, trying to portray some good traits into the younger younger guys, but also being able to have a laugh. As you can obviously see, he's a hilarious man. Um, no, he's a great guy to, to have on on your side. So we should say, anyone watching on the Facebook Live, 
send in your questions. So we'll ask Mitch those as well. Um, but from Jack, what was the number one moment in your career so far? Um, probably what we touched on earlier, just the, the final series in general. It was amazing to be a part of. Um, I'm hoping that that's not the last one for me. I'm, I'm hoping there's some finals to come in the near future um, and that hopefully they can they can top it. But, um, yeah, probably just probably that three-week period in 2018 was um, was amazing. I don't think we spoke about it before, but round one, 2016, I think it was, uh, against the Northern Blues, the big mark. Uh, <laughs> what was the reaction around that? Oh, I'm very thankful that happened, to be honest, because I reckon that's probably what chucked me on the draft radar in general with um, – it was the first round of the season and um, weirdly enough, the guy I took the mark on was a guy by the name of Matt Dick who grew up in the same area as me playing some rep footy together and cricket. So I knew him quite well. Um, so um, to his disgust when he turned around to see that it was me that sat on his head, um, I'm very grateful that that, that happened. So <laughs> but that was just more of like a, I've always been like a, a big jumper and quite athletic and more just the right time, right place, managed to hang on to it. Uh, so we do have a question from the Facebook Live right now. Um, with the Sir Douglas Nichols uh, round just happening, uh, what were your three favourite Indigenous Guernseys? Uh, oh, out of all the clubs? Out of all the clubs, yeah. Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> Tough question. I, did, I actually didn't mind North, so I was watching their game the other night. Um, yeah, North was pretty good. I have to say, ours. I love ours. We get to we get to keep one every year, um, which is amazing. Um, sick, sick. I'm quite close with Neville Jetta as well as a as a friend, and and he had a big part in the designing of the Guernsey this year. Um, who else do I like? I don't know. It's a tough one. No, nah, North's was definitely pretty good. I was watching up with when I was watching the Collingwood game, and yeah, yeah definitely just very uh, very cool that one. Yeah, let's go with North and, and Melbourne. We'll call it there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one's from Jack, uh, not from the Facebook page, but uh, he says, "What he asks, what premiership team from the last 20 years would you have wished to be part of? Oh. Uh, premiership team. To be honest, I, uh, was, I grew up a West Coast supporter and I would have loved to have been a part of those final series that West Coast and Sydney were playing against each other in 05 and 06. Um, obviously, we won one of them and Sydney won the other. But if I could be in that team playing amongst like the likes of Judd, Kerr, Cousins and Cox, um, probably that group. Uh, so we do have a question from our producer, Tony. So big shout out to Tony. I haven't seen him in a while <laughs> but with it being on Zoom. But uh, what aspects of your game are you most proud of having improved? Um, I would say probably my, my sort of aerial game. So like I always pride myself on being a sort of a good runner and being able to sort of kick and do the fundamentals quite well. Um, but it wasn't till sort of later in my, my playing years, late back into Footscray and, and, uh, and then coming into Melbourne, my ability to sort of be able to time and jump and, and market the ball for a sort of mid-sized forward. Um, so I think, Something like that, something like my my aerial game is, is something I'm quite proud of working on over the last three or four years. Uh, this one's from Sean on the Facebook live stream as well. Uh, we kind of touched on this before, but that elimination goal put your name down in the history books of the Melbourne Football Club. You kind of answered the first half of this, but what is your recollection of the moment and how many times have you watched that replay yourself? <laughs> uh, my recollection is just pure adrenaline being in the moment and not really recognizing the magnitude of it um i'm just glad it went through but um i have watched it oh, to be honest too many times purely because i've been sent it from that many people being like have you seen this the titanic remix and i'm like <laughs> yes i have <laughs> thank you for reminding me but um look it's one of those things at the moment that i'm kind of it was only two years ago um where i'm sort of like oh yeah that happened let's move on there's still some good footy to be played but no doubt um, when I'm a lot older, it'll be one of those moments I'm quite fondly look back at and, and be glad I was a part of. Uh, last one, I think, for, for now. Um, with all the news of it going on, uh, where do you think the grand final should be held? Um, look, I think it should be held in Queensland purely just because of how accommodating, that, accommodating they've been in terms of hosting all of the clubs up here. I mean, the state regulations are 
completely separate from the AFL. Um, and I can understand them just sort of wanting to close their borders and be like, no, let's keep ourselves safe. But they've, um, they've been great in being able to have us all up here. So I think it's only fair that they um, they probably gave it to Queensland. Whether that's that's Medricon or the Gabba, I don't really have a preference. Um, but I'm sure it'll probably, it, most likely I feel like it will be up this way. Now, uh, I think we're out of listener questions. Uh, sorry if we didn't get to yours, if we've just missed it. But, uh, Mitch, you mentioned you're a big fan of podcasts, and I think our quiz, our podcast quiz, is the best one out there. Uh, so you're going to be going up against Jackson. I'm going to be hosting a quiz. It's going to be five questions. Uh, so your name is your buzzer. And are you ready to just get straight into question one? Sure. Let's do it. Let's go for it. All right. So uh, just I probably should tell you before, these five questions are all vaguely related to your career, not too much. So it's not like what's your birthday or something like that, but yeah. something related to your career kind of. So okay. first question is, Hanan or Hanan is a city in Japan's Osaka prefecture. So it's 8.41 on the eastern seaboard right now. What time is it in Osaka? Uh, Jackson? Yeah. Is it uh, five forty one PM? Five forty one PM is incorrect. Mm. Is it Mitch? Yeah, go for it, Mitch. Four forty one? Four forty one is also incorrect. Mm. It's only an hour behind, so it's oh. seven forty one. Oh. Yeah, there you go. It's very interesting. You been to Japan before? No, I haven't, but I would love to. I uh, I had plans of going there prior to AFL life as I was at I was really getting into my snowboarding, and that was always the place to go. So, I'd be one day. Yeah, it's skiing in Japan. Melbourne fans know they're skiing, and the skiing is <laughs> lovely. I'm trying, I'm trying so, to watch the trend. We can get on snowboards instead. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll move on to question two. So, uh, Mitch, you're number 19. That's correct, yeah? Correct. Yep. Uh, so, 19 is an album by which English singer songwriter? <sighs> uh, Mitch. Mitch. Adele? Adele. Of course correct. it is. Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> Names them after her age, I think. Uh, so, yeah, 19. I think it came out in 2008, 2009, something like that. Uh, but so Mitch has won all up. Uh, Jackson got to get back into it quick smart because he, he won his last quiz, but I think that's one of the only ones that won. <laughs> He's not great on the quiz. But anyway, moving to question three. So this one's closest to the pin. So three Mitchells have played test cricket for Australia, first name Mitchell. How many wickets do they have combined, those three Mitchells, test wickets? Oh. Uh, Jackson. Jackson? I'll go 201. 201, okay. Mitch, what about you? Uh, I'm going to go a bit higher. I'm going to go about 350. The answer is 599. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Mitchell Stark alone would have had 200, I reckon. Yeah. Uh, so the three are Mitchell Johnson, Mitchell Stark, and Mitchell Marsh. Yeah. Uh, so Mitch Johnson's got 244. Yep. Mitch Stark's got 313, and Mitch Marsh has got 42. Uh, and that's as of late March, I think, when the cricket all stopped. So there you go. Mitch is 2 0 up. <laughs> Jackson's got to get this one, mate. <laughs> so. Uh, question four, uh, Mitch, just for listeners, what's your birthday? Uh, the 9th of March, 94. The 9th of March, great date. So on the 9th of March, 1896, or maybe that should say 1796, but we'll go with 1896, which military leader married Josephine de Boanet? I would not have a clue. A military leader. In 18... 18- I might um, just double check that because I might have made a time. <laughs> it might be 1796. Uh, I'll just go have a look. Uh, it was 1796, 1796, sorry. So got married uh, in 1796. Yeah, Jackson? Step. Yeah. Is it Julius Caesar? Julius Caesar is incorrect. Mm. It's about 2,000 years too late there, I think, mate. I don't know uh, my history, mate. <laughs> Mitch, do you want to have a go? If you get it wrong, I'll give you both a clue. No, I honestly would not have a clue. History is not my forte. If you have a stab, I'll give you both a clue so you can both go in again. <laughs> oh, no, I'll just give you a clue now and open no, it back up to both of you. So 
that were the civil ceremony took place at the Louvre, the famous museum, the Louvre. Does that help? Gives you a nationality, I think. Yeah, French. Yeah, what, who's a famous French military leader? I bet you. Uh, this is. Jackson. Jackson. Is it Napoleon? Napoleon's correct. Ah, yes. Have you heard of Napoleon? Mitch? I have. Yeah, it took yeah. me a while. Though. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well, Jackson's back, and it's two-one. But our last question: there's potential to get five points here, so this could make or break the game. So it's a who am I question. We're going to go down from five points all the way down to one point with a series of clues. And, uh, yeah, once you buzz in, and if you get it wrong, uh, you can't buzz in again until the other person gets it wrong. So, for five points, I was born on the 4th of February, 1983, in Devonport, Tasmania. It's a bit tricky, so I'll just move it on straight away. Yeah. For four points... I'm most known for my AFL career, where I used my 194 centimetre height to great effect. Mm. Nah. Can I move on? Next. Uh, for three points, I was drafted at pick 46, the same as you, Mitch, in the 2001 National Draft and went on to play 184 games for the club that drafted me before, I move, before moving to a club from the same state where I played 60 games. So 184 games to for one club and then 60 games for the next club. Tassie. 194 centimetres. I have no clue. Okay, I'll move it on. Uh, so, Jackson, you're 2-1 down, so you've got to get it at the two points. You want to, want to win it outright. Uh, so for two points, I established myself as a prominent forward in the league in 2005 kicking 36 goals and finish, finishing second in the club leading goal kicking behind Brendan Favola. Oh, uh, Jackson? Jackson. Is it Jared White? Jared White is correct. <laughs> oh, bad. He's, he's come back from <laughs> down at question three. To beat you, Mitch. Mitch, shocking performance. How do you <laughs> <for me? laughs> I've never been a big, like, even though I play the game, I've never been good on the old history. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But, um, Jackson, it's two on the spin for you, mate. Uh, but uh, I think we've gone way over time. So I think we'll wrap that up. So uh, goodbye to you, Facebook Live stream watchers. And thank you very much, Mitchell Hannon, for coming on the show. Not a problem, guys. Thank you very much for having me today. And we're back. How good was that, Harper? Oh, Jackson, very, very good indeed. I'm sure each and every one of our listeners will agree. A mighty fine episode. Yeah, more than definitely. Uh, again, thank you to everyone who tuned in into the Facebook Live uh, this past week. It was probably about a week before we've released this. So, yeah, very good for our first sort of live episode. Yeah, very, very good indeed. Um, Mitch Hannon, big thanks for coming on, mate. And thanks to all you listeners for listening as well and the people on Facebook Live. But if people want to watch our Facebook Lives, which we do with all our big interviews uh, with the sports stars uh, or any of our other socials, where do they go? So search Where Do We Begin on Facebook. On Instagram and Twitter, we are WDWBigPod. And can they follow us on Patreon, Harper? Yeah, they can check out our Patreon. And if they want to do so, we've actually had – uh, $10 Patreon sign up in the past couple of weeks who gets a shout out every week goes by the name of Al Messi so big shout out to you Lionel for jumping on board uh, if you want to uh, head over to our Patreon and help us uh, with a bit of financially and reap the rewards we've got some great benefits on there it's patreon.com forward slash WDWB pod. That is patreon.com forward slash WDWB pod. It's a bloody nice group of letters, those letters, bit of a mouthful. But uh, Jackson, I believe we've got some music on the show before we leave it there. Yeah, definitely. So we are going to end this show with a great tune by great friends of ours who have also been on this show before on chat pod number two. So go and check that out if you haven't. We're, we're, showing, uh, we're showing off. Chase the Sun by our friends, The Rooms. It's a, it's a banger, don't you think, Harper? 
Oh, an absolute banger. Um, that Yeah, WD, WB Extra, number two, if you like the song and want to hear even more of their voices, their talking voices, uh, so check them out. It's The Rooms, the R-V-M-E-S, nice funky little spelling. Yeah, definitely. It was a great, great, interesting chat with those boys. I uh, had a really good time talking to them. Yeah, a Kiwi lads, great stuff. Um, but thanks very much for listening, guys. We'll throw over to The Rooms with Chase the Sun. Chase the sun, gotta chase the sun Sound of